Lyon, we do have a potential new member with us today. His name is William. He goes by Bill Black. Yeah, look at him shake his head no on William. You, sir, will be joining the world's largest and most active service club. There are about 1.3 million folks scattered all around the world. We'll talk about that later on. You'll learn more about that as we go along. You're becoming part of a distinguished service history that dates back to the early 1940s, just prior to World War II starting. I, I apologize, to World War I starting. This club got started about the time World War II started. So we sort of tie in a little bit with armed conflict, but we try to avoid them and, and, and spend our time helping people. Uh, there was a gentleman named Melvin Jones who came up with the concept of instead of a bunch of folks sitting around once a week eating and trying to sell each other surreys and, and horse fables and, and new mares and stuff, that instead these individuals ought to be trying to better and better their community they lived in and, and help people who were impoverished and needed help. And from that humble beginning, Lions Club got started. And the members began volunteering their time and their talents to meet these nations. We're real proud here in Texas that the very first convention for Lions, what became Lions International, was held in Texas. Now, unfortunately, it was held up in Dallas instead of down here in Houston, where it's been done right anyway. Lions, you will discover, are especially dedicated to serving the blind and the visually impaired. This commitment began with the challenge, challenge from Helen Keller back in 1925, when she asked all lions to become knights for the blind in a crusade against darkness. And since that point in time, lions clubs have had it more or less as a spearhead, helping visually impaired, although we now try to help kids with this, and older folks with that, other kind of folks with other things. And we try to improve our community any way that we can. Our motto is we serve. And it exemplifies the dedication to helping those in need that is felt by members throughout the world. Your membership in the Living Splendid Lions Club will help us to carry on this tradition into the future. You will find some opportunities for personal growth as you go along. Although before we get through with you up here today, we want you to brag on how good you are, how smart you are, what you know about dead chicken parts, and all sorts of things, okay? We do want you to do that. But we're going to give you an opportunity to learn teamwork on a volunteer basis instead of paying somebody to get something done, okay? The officers and the members of this club are happy that you've chosen them to help us continue the legacy of Lionism by improving the lives of the less fortunate and helping to make this area an even better place in which to live. Since you haven't expressed a desire to affiliate with this club, you were asked to join, you were voted on by the board of directors after a discussion about your character, and we decided you're a pretty good guy. And uh, I will ask you, though, to respond to the following words with either I do or I will. Do you hereby accept membership in the Livingston Lions Club knowing that you're encouraged to participate in all functions of the club? I do. To the best of your ability, will you abide by the Lions Code of Ethics, attend meetings regularly, and contribute your fair share to the programs of this club, the district we are in, and Lions International? I will. Congratulations. You're now officially a member of the Livingston Lions Club. And we're glad you're here. Thank you. Right. I'm now going to ask our club secretary to give to the sponsor a pin that will be your membership pin. Are you giving him the sponsor stuff? No, I want him to have the member stuff. I want, no, this is the important guy. Let's go ahead, right for a good. Okay. All right, on second thought, I'm going to ask the secretary to give the new member his stuff. We would like you to wear that membership pin at any opportunity. 
And Lyndon Clark, as you realize the pen you have is the pen for Lyndon International recognizes you for having brought this gentleman into Lyndonism. We are very pleased to give you these small tokens to let you know that we're proud of you and we want you aboard. In fact, Lyndon Clark, I want to thank you for bringing us this new member. Now, will you pledge to guide this new person into being a greater member by introducing him to each of your fellow members, especially those guys at your table? I don't know whether that's a bit much to introduce him to, but those fellows. And by working alongside him with upcoming projects and to answer any questions about membership that he comes up with in the next few months. Will you help him with that? Okay, good deal. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask the members, any dues paid member of the Livingston Lions Club who thinks their dues are up to date, to please rise. <laughs> Will you raise your right hand and say these words with me? It is indeed a pleasure to all of us to have you join our ranks in lionism. Please know you can call on any of us for help. Please know you can call on any of us for help as you join us in making this a better community. As you join us in making this a better community. Good deal. We do that even with fire alarms going all around this place. Y'all be seated. Thank you very much. Um, Lyon Black, when you were coming up, I made a comment about chicken park. Maybe that was impromptu on my part. I'm going to turn this podium around and for a few minutes, we would like for you to tell us a short resume of your history and what you do and what you have done and family and whatever you want this club to know about you. Uh, for the most part, you can probably hear me without this microphone. My name is Bill Black. I'm the owner of Chicken Express here in town. Uh, one of the, I got a partner, but um, I'm the general manager to work here all the time. Uh, we just moved to Livingston area uh, exactly a little over two years ago. Um, we were moved down here because of grandkids. That's the main reason. My daughter took the three the grandkids we had. She's a teacher at uh, Cedar Grove. My son-in-law is the uh, children and uh, family minister at First Baptist Church, which is where we attend. Uh, history, graduated from Texas Tech. Yay! Yeah, kind of a, not a whole lot of history here. Texas Tech, and uh, uh, I worked my way through college running restaurants, which is kind of gives me kind of where I am now. Um, became a hospital administrator, moved to Eastland County, where I met my wife, Paulette. We've now been married 31 years, coming up. So, um, and think about that. Um, and uh, about three years after the worst job I'd ever had in my life, which was hospital management, you just don't ever go there. Um, I became a police officer and did that for 28 years for the city of Cleburne. I'm still a reserve police officer in the town of Cleburne. However, they don't require me to go back. I think they got tired of me. Um, so I'm still doing that. So um, my history has just kind of been all over there. Um, I'm very much uh, a supporter of law enforcement still, always will be, and uh, uh, want to ask you all at any opportunity to honor those who have given their uh, lives, because it is a true service. So, um, Three grandkids, uh, 23 months old up to age uh, eight, uh, having the time of their lives right now. At two of them are right here at Choye this week at, at camp. Um, I have two other children. Uh, my son is 29. My daughter is 27. They both live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, one works at a factoring company, bookkeeping stuff, and the other one is a uh, restaurant manager. So, kind of runs in the in the family. Uh, I got to know Clark, and who's my you know, Clark sponsored me here. And we first moved here, we started looking for land to build a restaurant. So that's how he and I got hooked up and. I started talking to him early on about uh, 
Should I go rotary or lions or you know? And, uh, about that. <laughs> <laughs> so he got me. He got me hooked in that way. So anyway, I thank you greatly for uh, letting me join. Oh, one last thing. I was a lion in 1984 for two and a half years when I was in the town of Gorman. Uh, as a hospital administrator, I was a lion then. So uh, I even have, I bagged my lion, a pin. I still have, plus my original membership pin. So um, things you keep for 30 plus years. So anyway, so this is not my first rodeo as it comes to lions. I, I was familiar with it from way back then, but in becoming a police officer, never had a chance to get really get back into it. Uh, I spoke at several Lions Club meetings over the years presenting police related topics, but uh, I never joined. So, uh, thank you again. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, last year we were going to have someone come and speak to us about NASA, and that, that just didn't work out. Uh, so, this year, uh, our line from Woodville, Congressman Brian Babbitt, is going to give us an update on NASA. Let's give him a warm welcome. say thank you so much and also for your new member uh, Lion Black uh, former police officer and uh, there's some other police officers in here right? Yeah. Yeah. Is the sheriff? Oh, no. is, is the sheriff in here? Yes sir. Yeah. Sheriff? I didn't see. I didn't. Okay there he is right there. Okay. Just want to say thank you to your police officers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for putting it on the line. Uh, just like our military. Uh, it's a, it's a bad time to be a police officer in this country in many cities across this nation. And uh, I appreciate what you do. And we need, to, we need to back our police officers up 100%. Thank you. Well, I want to pre uh, tell you how much I appreciate uh, being here. Uh, the, this Lions Club is actually one of the first places, campaign stops, that I made uh, back in January of 2014, uh, over two years ago. And uh, it's great to be back here with all of you, my neighbors. Uh, and I also would like to introduce real quick my wife of 43 years, oh, Roxanne Bavin, is back there. And my, one of my 13, one of our 13 grandchildren, oh, wow. Boone Spurlock. Boom. <laughs> He's a big five-year-old, and uh, he's over here visiting in Polk County, and uh, six. six. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, there's 13, 13 on there. <laughs> All right. Uh, but I just want to talk to you a few minutes about uh, our space program. Uh, last year, I was named, very, very fortunate to be named, uh, as the space subcommittee chairman of the House uh, Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And it's been a real treat to me because I'm old enough to remember, uh, I remember just like it was yesterday, 1957, sitting at the breakfast table, radio was on, Beaumont, Texas, and my dad said, My goodness, they've got a satellite up there. The Russians have put up a, a, a satellite, Sputnik. I know there's some guys in here older, at least as old as me or older. So you've got to remember that. And that's what started the space race. Uh, so let me talk to you a little bit about that. I'm honored to represent almost 14,000 person workforce supporting the Johnson Space Center down in Clear Lake uh, in Harris County. A lot of folks don't realize how big the 36th Congressional District is, Lionheart. Uh, this thing is nine counties. It runs from, from Newton, Jasper, Tyler, and uh, Polk counties all the way down through uh, uh, into Orange County. It takes in uh, Chambers County as well as a part of uh, Harris County all the way down to Clear Lake, Seabrook, and that area. We have the Port of Houston, and uh, we, we have more petrochemical refining facilities uh, than, uh, than any other district in this country. Uh, we're very fortunate to have that. And so I'm, I'm very proud to be, to be representing this district, which is about roughly 725 or 730,000 people. But there are 14,000 folks that work at JSC, Johnson Space Center, and uh, they fight 
uh, for the American Space Program as a whole in Congress uh, there at, at Johnson Space Center, and that is exactly what I have been doing uh, for uh, the past year and a half or so. Uh, Senator Cruz, Ted Cruz is my counterpart in the U.S. Senate. Uh, he's the subcommittee chairman there. Uh, but I want to say that Texas is very well represented uh, and positioned well with bipartisan sp uh, space congressional oversight and the appropriations for the money and for the authorizing committees uh, for, our, uh, for our, our district. Uh, space is very, very vital to our nation's security, as you might imagine. I cannot overemphasize that. Our enemies know it too. And for instance, I will tell you, the, uh, the Chinese, the People's Republic of China, have been demonstrating what we call direct ascent anti-satellite technology for many years. And uh, with, uh, about a couple of years ago, they actually went up and zapped uh, with, with, a, with a weapon and killed a satellite. They have satellite killers in space today. And recently, Air Force Lieutenant General Jay Raymond uh, stated in reference to China's capabilities that soon every single satellite uh, in orbit will be able will, will be held at risk, and this is what we're facing. Uh, we must protect our access and our ability to operate in space if we want to have a secure home front, and we want to have a secure home front. I can assure you. We're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, towards the end. Well, where are we in our space program now? We have a very active program, folks, as you know, since 1958, uh, at the, at when, when NASA was, uh, was founded, uh, and uh, we've been very active. And I've had the great honor and privilege of knowing some of the great uh, personages in, in our space program, with Dr. Chris Kraft, uh, Gene Cernan, Gene Kranz, uh, some of these folks, uh, Buzz Aldrin, uh, second man to walk on the moon, I met these, these people, had great conversations with them. Very impressive to, to talk to these folks. Uh, Dr. Christopher Kraft, who was the uh, Johnson uh, Space Center uh, flight director through all the heyday of the space program. Is, I talked to him on the phone day before yesterday, and uh, he is now 92 years old, and he's still got a very sharp mind. Uh, and there are some amazing things to see out at Johnson Space Center. Uh, it's not just a museum, although there is a very fine museum out there uh, which you need to go see. It is a hub, a very busy hub, of NASA's human spaceflight programs and a lot of projects and work are going on uh, as we speak. Every time I stop by the Johnson Space Center, I'm truly reminded of the extraordinary accomplishments that we've made as a nation in our space program. The inventions, the developments that have come out of 50, roughly 55 years or so of our space program are unbelievable, and they're too numerous to, to list. Every aspect of our everyday lives um, are touched by these, uh, by these developments from medicines and uh, medications, uh, uh, communications, navigation, uh, uh, our computer systems, uh, our defense, weather forecasting, even Velcro has come out of it. There are thousands of items and inventions that have come out of our space program, and we would be very, very, uh, uh, we would not be enjoying life near as much today if we had not had a space program. I've had the recent pleasure of working with astronaut uh, Scott Kelly, who just returned from a year in space. He's, he spent more time in space than any other American in history, uh, 340 days, just short of a year. Uh, at the International Space Station. This mission gives us a great opportunity as a dentist and a healthcare professional. Uh, it's, it's always been very interesting to me. I've had some great conversations with, with uh, astronaut Kelly and his physicians at, at J, uh, JSC. And they are, uh, they are studying. He happens to be a, an identical twin. He has a, a twin brother, Mark Kelly, uh, who, did not, who has also been an astronaut. And they are, uh, but he has not spent that much time in space. So they're, they're comparing some really interesting things. The effects of long duration space uh, <coughs> flight and uh, what, what the, some of the effects it has on vision, ocular pressures, uh, it does something funny to your eyeballs. We do know that bone density loss, if you're familiar with uh, uh, some of the problems we have uh, as we get older, our calcium uh, 
our bones are less dense. <coughs> You've seen uh, folks that they're afflicted with osteoporosis. It has that same effect, uh, and it's because of the weightlessness. We still don't quite understand how it works. We're still looking at this, but there are many other aspects and trying to understand how and what happens to our bodies when uh, and how they react in the extreme environment of space uh, so that we can prepare for longer duration space missions and uh, if that's not uh, if that's it's not all completely hunky dory at our space program uh, and frankly when I took office as the chairman uh, there are many there are problems that, that NASA uh, is facing uh, in fact, the administration that we currently have has failed to give NASA uh, clear-cut goals and future space missions. And you know, are we gonna, going to go to Mars? Are we going to return to, uh, to uh, the, the moon surface? What are our priorities? We've had a hard time getting this out of this current administration. NASA has been plagued with instability from constantly changing requirements, budgets, and missions. We cannot change our mission and focus every time there's a new administration, every time there's a new president. And I'm certain that everyone here knows that there's nothing easy about developing space programs. It's expensive and it requires years, literally years, of planning ahead. So changing course every four to eight years with uh, new administrations, it sure as nothing gets accomplished very efficiently. And that's what we've been facing. We have some legislation uh, to make our director of NASA in Washington uh, rather than having it change every time there's a president to give him a, uh, a eight to ten year uh, tenure so, so that it's not changed every time we change presidents. You may remember that in 2010 uh, President Obama canceled, very suddenly, unexpectedly canceled what was called the Constellation Program. Uh, this was a group of uh, developing space rockets, our lunar rover that could uh, uh, go over the surface of the moon, uh, a crew capsule and all the supporting systems uh, which was going to be used to, uh, for us to return to the moon. We haven't had a man on the moon since, uh, uh, since Gene Cernan was the last guy uh, in, in about 1972, I think it was. Uh, so this was, uh, the Constellation program would have returned us to the moon, but he canceled this. Uh, and uh, what was going to be used uh, to return us to the moon uh, and replace the space shuttle and after it retired, and we absolutely had nothing to replace it with. He canceled these programs. Nothing was, uh, was proposed to, to, to replace this. Luckily, Congress stepped in bipartisanly. Uh, both uh, Democrats and Republicans stepped in and ensured that these core, uh, these core systems and programs would continue. It has been six years, and our space program is still feeling uh, this, uh, this sudden change in our, in our program and that decision by the administration. An example of this is the fact that the United States currently relies, believe this or not, we rely on the Russians uh, to put our astronauts up on the International Space Station. We, uh, we pay for a ticket, literally. <laughs> we pay $70 million to $80 million per seat to get our astronauts up there on our own International Space Station because we don't have the rocketry uh, to do this any longer since we retired the uh, space shuttle and then the Constellation program was uh, was canceled. Um, we we absolutely have to. Uh, this is one of my goals. We have to end the reliance on the Russians uh, for our our astronauts. The newly formed Texas Space Congressional Caucus, which I'm a member of, has recently had a productive meeting with Bill Gerstenmaier who. It happens to be the uh, NASA's uh, Human Space Flight Program's director. Very knowledgeable man. Uh, we're concerned that uh, some of the priorities may be changing, and, and Johnson Space Center, which has absolutely been the epicenter of our space program, uh, some of our programs and instrumentation and personnel may, uh, may uh, be leaving to go to other states, and we're trying to hold that off. We've had another meeting in the works for uh, several, uh, for next month, uh, with uh, Johnson Space Center Director, former astronaut, Helen Ochoa, uh, to meet with our Texas delegation in Washington. These meetings show that NASA uh, and the Texas delegation are committed, absolutely committed, uh, to resolving these issues and keeping Texas an absolute key player uh, in, the, in the space program in years to come. Uh, in 2016, NASA received the largest budget that it's had in decades, fully funding the space station, 
the Orion program, the capsule, the SLS, the space launch system, uh, and commercial crew for, uh, for resupplying the uh, International Space Station. These are all very critical programs for Johnson Space Center and our entire human spaceflight program <coughs> across the country. Uh, we've, got to get, we've got to find a way to get Americans uh, back to flying on American rockets from American soil to get them into space. Where are we headed now? Uh, right now, when our astronauts fly to the International Space Station, they travel up in the, uh, beyond the atmosphere about 240 miles up. Uh, that's, that's about the distance from San Antonio to Houston. Uh, this region is called uh, LEO, L-E-O, stands for Low Earth Orbit. And personally, I would like to see NASA shift its focus. We've, we've, we've had continuous manning of the International Space Station for 15 years now in low Earth orbit. I think we need to shift our focus from low Earth orbit uh, to the original charter of human exploration for deep space beyond low Earth orbit. But the transportation of astronauts and cargo to the International Space Station and into low Earth orbit will be well covered with a very active commercial effort already 10 years into the program, five years uh, beyond that 10 years, and 15 uh, uh, years of fully uh, 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 manning the International Space Station, as I said. And for the first time in a decade, we authorized the Commercial Space Launch Act, which will ensure our nation's commercial space companies are not hampered by excess government red tape so they can lead the world in commercial space where we have always uh, been the world's leader in space. And it's very encouraging, I might add, to see what America's innovative commercial space uh, companies are doing. These, these companies are absolutely phenomenal. I've toured many of their facilities. Uh, Boeing uh, is building what they call their CST-100 Starliner crew capsule. Uh, SpaceX is building a crew version of their Dragon capsule. And Sierra Nevada is developing what they call the Dream Chaser, which is a cargo capsule that looks like a miniature version of the space shuttle that we're all familiar with. Cargo is already being transported uh, to the ISS, or the International Space Station, via SpaceX's Dragon cargo vehicle, and also on orbital ATK Cygnus air, uh, spacecraft. We have rockets that are taking our cargo up there. We don't, we're not dependent upon the Russians for our cargo, but we are for the astronauts. Uh, this growth demonstrates that there are very capable commercial efforts supporting NASA uh, on carrying uh, these, uh, these cargo go to the human space flights and transportation uh, of this cargo to the International Space Station. Last year, I had the, the, the great opportunity and privilege to see some of the commercial development happening out in California at Mojave Spaceport, uh, out in the desert. Uh, it, it, it is a phenomenal place and a lot of phenomenal things are going on there. One company called Stratolaunch <laughs> is building an airplane that is absolutely unbelievable. I walked into this hangar and the guy that's the manager of uh, Mojave says, uh, he says, Doc, just hold, hold on to your, your hat because when you see this airplane, I said, is it bigger than the Spruce Goose of, uh, uh, that was built? You all remember the Spruce Goose, the largest aircraft ever built? He said, it dwarfs it. I walked in, I couldn't believe it. This is two Boeing 747s put together. And it's going to, it's two fuselages, if y'all know anything about aircraft. And in between the fuselage, and it, its wingspan is uh, almost, uh, I think it's almost 300 feet across. That's a football foot. You know, that's unbelievable. And it carries a 500,000 pound payload in between these two fuselages. So it, the plane can lift off, it can go up in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, and it can shoot that. Uh, that rocket so that you don't have to go through all the rigmarole of launches from the ground, which are very costly and time consuming. And this thing has, it has yet to make its maiden flight. It's supposed to happen sometime in 2018. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing that thing fly. I believe it can fly when I see it. It's that, it's that big. Uh, Virgin Galactic also briefed us on their production of their space tourism vehicle. So, you got twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. You can you can buy a ticket and go up into space and uh, see what it feels like to uh, uh, to be weightless. I know 
if you drive at some uh, some folks' automobiles, you probably already kind of know that. Uh, we also saw the Mastin Company, which showed us their vertical landing and, and uh, takeoff rockets. I can't stress enough how inspiring it is to see these people spending their own money, not our, not tax money, uh, creating new technologies that will continue to propel us and our country into the future. Now, relative to NASA's human deep space exploration of space, we are currently developing the largest rocket ever built, and it's called the SLS, or the Space Launch System I mentioned earlier. It is an enormous rocket, bigger than the Saturn V, which put our Apollo uh, missions up, up into, uh, up, uh, on the way to the moon. Uh, and this, this also will be carrying the, the Orion crew capsule uh, vehicle that will ride on top of this gigantic rocket. Uh, SLS and Orion are our vehicles of the future. These will be the one. This, this rocket and the Orion capsule will take us back to the moon and will take us on to Mars. Uh, we're hoping, or maybe even beyond Mars, we're hoping to, to, by the 2030s, early 2030s, that we'll, we'll have a Martian mission. There are still many, many hurdles uh, to overcome before traveling to Mars. For instance, how are we going to protect our, our astronauts from radiation? Once you get out of low Earth orbit, uh, the, the cosmic radiation that comes from deep space or from our sun in different regions of our universe are very harmful. Uh, to the human body. We've got to learn how to protect our, our astronauts up there. Uh, lead and water are two of the greatest uh, insulators for that. Unfortunately, they're both extremely heavy. And so we're, we're, we're working on some different things. Uh, uh, electromagnetism, there's a lot of uh, smart guys that are trying to, and, and women, uh, uh, <laughs> trying to come up with the, the solutions to this. How will we overcome a 30-minute communication delay? You tell, you're trying to talk to your astronauts uh, headed to Mars, it takes 30 minutes for our, for our voices to get to them, and then 30 minutes for them to get back. Uh, and the deeper we go into space, for instance, the New Horizons that just uh, flew by, uh, last year just flew by Pluto, that took nine and a half years to get from Earth to Pluto, uh, it took uh, absolutely several days, up to a week, to, to to get the signals back from it and get our signals to a New Horizons uh, vehicle. Unbelievable. Uh, so how will we provide necessary provisions of food, water, and oxygen for a year-long mission to mark to the Martian surface? What kind of habitat will we have to keep our astronauts uh, protected from the Martian environment? And we have to remember, we've got to get these guys and gals back, too. We can't just get them up there. Uh, they're going to want to come home. Believe it or not, there are so, so many uh, zealous and fearless astronauts that many of them have told me, I don't care if I come back. I want to go. I want to see uh, and be the, be the pioneer to, to find out what's going on. These people are, are incredible when you talk to them. On the International Space Station, if there's, an, if there's a, a medical emergency, uh, up there 240 miles up, an astronaut can be back on the ground in just several hours. Uh, even a trip to the moon is just uh, a few days away. A trip to Mars and back to Earth, months. Months and months. Uh, how will we handle a medical care? Uh, there are some significant hurdles uh, that we've got to cross, but I'm very confident uh, that we have some really brilliant minds working on this. Uh, just an hour and a half down the road at Johnson Space Center. All right, we're at a point where as a country, we must understand that space is a strategically critical arena. As I mentioned earlier on the Chinese, this is a critical arena to the national security of our, of our country. Space as a national defense asset is no longer a debatable effort any more than the presence of having an army, an air force, a marine corps, or a navy. Uh, our war fighters use space-based assets every aspect of their duty every day uh, General Hyten, who is the commander of Air Force Space Command, constantly stresses uh, that this reliance necessitates our continued interest in investments and protecting uh, the capabilities that we have in developing more. A declassified example is our GPS, our Global Positioning Satellite System. Uh, the first uh, GPS navigation system was called Transit. In 1960, the Navy sent up five satellites. Uh, it provided a navigation fix every hour. Fast forward to 94, it was fully operational, and GPS had a constellation of 24 satellites in orbit 
and there's some unbelievable things that are going on with our satellite program today and weather forecasting uh, and uh, uh, intelligence gathering. It's, it's, it's truly incredible. Most of us are familiar with GPS as a navigational tool, but don't forget that it's used for far more than just the military. For GPS allows precise target tracking. It's the foundation of smart weapons, smart bombs that direct a payload to a target. They even carry a set of nuclear detonation detection sensors. They, they, they know, uh, like for instance, when the North Koreans, when they uh, have, a, have a nuclear test, those things can detect it almost immediately. Our national defense is dependent on GPS. And what about civilian use of GPS? I bet everybody in this room uses GPS at one time or another. Farmers in our, there you go, farmers in our district use GPS for crop monitoring, precision planting, spraying, harvesting. Uh, firefighters use it to monitor wildfire uh, uh, spreads and growth. Our shipping, rail, transport, and aviation industries all rely on GPS. And let's not forget that this is only one space system and not even the exhaustive list of all of its uses. Uh, that's just one example of all the developments that we've had from space. Space touches just about every segment of our community, as I said a little earlier. Weather, communications, banking, medicine, on and on. And to seed and give up the high ground of space would be a, an enormous mistake that would result in a lethal blow to our defensive capabilities and also to our way of life. But there are those that feel like we don't need a space system. We don't need to be spending uh, those, uh, those funds uh, on our space program. I, I, I strongly disagree with it. Make no mistake, this is a very worthwhile investment for the taxpayer and our nation. It inspires the next generation of explorers to pursue science, <laughs> technology, and math and engineering. It advances U.S. soft power and international relations. It reinforces our aerospace industrial base. It increases our economic competitiveness, and it furthers our national security interests without a doubt. Space exploration requires a clear-cut mission, and it requires a destination, a goal. Constancy of purpose, unwavering dedication. I want you to know that these programs go on a tremendous support in the House, <coughs> in the Senate, at NASA, and the American <coughs> people. On the wall of our committee room at the, at the Space Science and uh, Technology Committee, pro, there's, a, there's a, an inscription. It's Proverbs 29, 18, and it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. And as the chairman of the Space Subcommittee, I want to tell you folks that I'm working constantly to make sure that NASA and our space program get that vision. And uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for your attention and inviting me back over here uh, to uh, speak to you. If you have any questions or concerns, I'll be glad to, to answer them. And I'd also like to make an invitation to everyone in this room and your families to come see uh, the capital of your great country. Uh, we will give you a tour. Let us know. Uh, we have a, we have a, just reach out to us and, and, and uh, our, either our Washington office and our Woodville office. Uh, first time Woodville's had an office of a congressman, I think, since 1897. Uh, but, but we're close. We're close to Polk County. And uh, we do have offices in Orange and in Deer Park. And so please reach out. We would love to give you a, a tour of the, of the Capitol, the White House, and uh, we love to have our constituents come up. And reach out to us if you have a problem with anything else, whether it's veterans, uh, Social Security, or any other problems you might have. But now I just want to say thank you for, uh, for having me as your guest speaker today, and I want to tell you how privileged I am and honored I am to be representing uh, Deep East Texas, my home, uh, in Washington, D.C. God bless you. Thank you.